please open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 18. You can also see the text on my left and follow along. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please pray with me. Father, we ask again that your word would continue to push ahead into our hearts and to our minds. Encourage us by it today. Save some by it today. Build up your people through it today. And may you receive glory and honor as you do. Amen. Thomas Jefferson once said, I find that the harder I work, the more luck I seem to have. Hard work has been the hallmark of success in many cultures, including our Western culture, for centuries. And there are many observations and sayings about the nature of work that laud the benefits of working hard. And we see those expressed through a variety of means. One old saying says that what is earned with hard labor is eaten with pleasure. Thomas Edison once said, the three great essentials to achieve anything worthwhile are hard work, stick to and common sense. Sir Isaac Newton said, if I, ha- if I am anything, which I highly doubt, I have made myself so by hard work. And author Stephen King once penned, what separates the talented individual from the successful one is a lot of hard work. Hard work is a moral virtue. And it's striking today that what was once so highly lauded as a moral virtue that brings about many positive benefits and good things is now in our culture in some ways something that seems to be avoided. Perhaps it started with the aspect of the American dream and retirement, which says in one breath, you can do whatever you set your mind to as long as you work hard, 
But then the notion of contemporary retirement comes into play and says, you should work hard for a season so that you can get to a point in life where you don't have to work anymore. And as a result, you can spend the last third of your life on recreation. Maybe that idea continued with the notion that our recreation is really the only reason why we work at all. We make money to find more ways to have fun and to comfort ourselves. And a lot of people live their life that way. And now it seems that there are elements in our culture that put forward that the notion of a life of leisure is really the thing that will be the most fulfilling to you. And we see that from the celebrities to the Instagram influencers to all kinds of people that would put forward that the notion of your best life that you can have is found when you can live in luxury and leisure. And work, well work, that's something to be avoided. Labor is something to be scorned. Hard work, that's something for common people. But what we see in the Bible is a very different story. And it's striking that Paul finishes this letter to the Thessalonians, a letter in which he addresses a variety of spiritual realities and a variety of practical realities. And he finishes the letter with some advice regarding the nature of work in that community. Contrary to the contemporary notion that work is something to be avoided, the Bible, we see that from the very beginning, work is something that is from God. We see that God is a God who works. That not only does he create, which is an act of working, but it is that in his power he's actively involved in expanding his kingdom, which is a form of work, through the work of regeneration and the work of calling and the work of salvation and the work of sanctification. We see that Jesus is a savior who works. Not only did he have a practical and physical job for most of his life as a carpenter. But he is the one that God has given the primary work of salvation to. And Colossians 1.17 tells us that in him, in Jesus, all things hold together. That's work. And Hebrews 1.17 tells us that Christ upholds the universe By the word of his power. That's work. So God's modeling of work leads to the command for people to work as well. And you see that from the very beginning that very closely tied to the notion that people are made in God's image is that people are to mirror some of the things that God does, including work. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Subdue it and have dominion over it. That's work. (laughs) And it was part of God's blessing to people. Genesis 2.15 says that the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And so the Lord models work and he also commands us to work. And he models rest, and he commands us to rest. On the seventh day, God made it holy because on it, God rested from all of his work that he had done in creation. And so just in a very brief few minutes, that's a basic theology, biblical theology of work. That work is good for us. That God 
does it, that we should do it, and it is well with us as we do. But work is difficult, and it's particularly difficult, we see, in the very early days of humanity because of sin. You might be thinking to yourself, if work is so good, then why do I hate my job? (laughs) Or if work is so good, then why do I come home exhausted every day? If work is at times enjoyable and at times difficult beyond measure, then how can it actually be good for me? Well, the answer is found in sin. When Adam and Eve first sinned by eating the apple... As part of the curse that followed that sin, work became more difficult. We see that right away in Genesis chapter 3. God said to Adam, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I've commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all of the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and from dust you shall return. So sin makes work less desirable, because work is harder And because work is harder and less desirable, we have the propensity to become lazy. And that's where we turn our attention to the text for today. Some of the people in Thessalonica had abandoned their work. And as we near the end of this letter, Paul ties the nature of their work to the faithfulness that they have expressed to God. Some of the people in this church have become freeloaders, lazy bums, people who had become incredibly burdensome on the rest of the church community as they expected everyone else to support their needs. These people weren't working by choice. And then they expected their friends and family members and their Christian brothers and sisters in this small congregation to simply care for their needs. And there can be two reasons for this, at least. It could be that they gave up their work because of the teaching that had been going on about the day of the Lord. You might remember earlier in the book there had been some false teaching about the second coming of Jesus and an element of that false teaching was that Jesus was coming soon, very soon, could be any minute now. And one of the beliefs around that was, well, if Jesus is coming back so soon, then why would I go to the trouble of working? It's hard, it's difficult. Why would I put forward my time doing that when there could be really be no benefit to me to experience the return of that work. This is sort of like the college student that says, why would I go to class and study hard and get a degree if there's no job and the benefit of a job on the other end of all of this hard work to do right now? So that's part of it. There's another part of this that could play into them, and that was the belief in the early Greek culture that work was something to be done, hard work, physical work was something to be done for the less honorable of society. In Greek culture, there was a common view that dignified people didn't do labor. They spent their time on things of the mind, not on things of the body. They believed in this dualistic nature that that sophisticated people recognized the precedence of the mind, of the brain that had over the body. And so philosophy was king. Spirituality was an activity of the mind. It wasn't physical in its nature. Only lower class people worked with their hands. And furthermore, in that time, it was the responsibility of some of the wealthy in society to function as patrons 
for those who were sophisticated but didn't have a steady stream of income. And this promoted a level of laziness and an unbiblical artificial divide between people. And so in one sense, it could be the false belief about the coming of Jesus, or maybe it was just the way that some of these people were taught in their culture, about the mind and the body and about work and about things of that nature. And it resulted in some of these Macedonian Christians not working. They were freeloading off of others. They were causing tension in the church. And this causes Paul not only to rebuke them, but also to give five motivations for them to start working hard. And these five motivations for them are also five motivations for us because in so many ways our culture is looking a lot more like first century Greece than we might like to admit. And the notions among different segments of society about work follows in line with that. And so here's five motivations to work. Motivation number one, Paul says, is to keep away from any brother walking in idleness. Verse 6, the command is very clear and it's got force behind it. Paul says, and he doesn't invoke the name of the Lord Jesus to back his commands very often, but he does so in this case. We command you in the name of our Lord Jesus to keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you had received from us. This is serious, Paul says. This is not mere social commentary. This is a command as if from the Lord. And the idea of being idle here could mean lazy and probably has an element of laziness to it. But beyond that, the idea of being idle, the nuance of the word means to be out of order. These people were acting and living in such a way that was out of order with the community setting. And this was caused by their unwillingness to work. Verse 14, near the end of the text, repeats the command. Take note of that person. Have nothing to do with them. That they may be ashamed. Now I know when you hear that, it probably sounds a bit harsh. It's certainly not in the norm of our culture to do such a thing for someone who's unwilling to work. But let's make a couple observations about it and how it might apply. Paul here is not talking about people who are unable to work due to physical illness or legitimate disability or maybe the fact that they lost their job in the middle of a nationwide crisis or even perhaps because of their age. There's a difference, isn't there, between someone who's unwilling and someone who is unable. He's not addressing the people who are unable. He's addressing the church regarding those who are unwilling. And the idle ones who can work but choose not to are the ones being rebuked. They're the unwilling and there's this expectation, observation number two, is there's this expectation that the community of faith has a role in the formation of people. Now the reason why that doesn't sit quite right with us today is the fact that we've all been reared with such a deeply ingrained sense of individualism that says, you can't tell me what to do. I worry about me you worry about you. And all of us sort of instinctually go through life that way. And in some ways that's right. Taking responsibility for your own actions is good. But in another way, we see that there are elements of our growth and transformation that happen through the community of people around us. And as Christians, that's through our local church community. And in this sense, Perseverance of the saints 
is a community project. We need Christians, other Christians, a community of Christians to encourage us, to teach us, to model faithfulness to the Lord Jesus for us, to pray for us, and even to correct us. This is applied here with regard to work. And because some were idle, Paul was saying that they would experience a level of church discipline. I think another observation that we have is that we don't often think about work as a moral issue. But here Paul is saying it very clearly a moral issue. It's a sin issue. For the Christian who's been redeemed from their sins to live in an ongoing sinful or ungodlike attitude toward work doesn't reflect the gospel that redeems the sin nature that hates work and that puts the curse of Genesis 3 in its place. And it puts us on the path to appreciate the good gifts of God, even in our work again. And so you might say that God cares about your work. And your work reflects something about God. God cares about your work. And your work reflects something about God. Motivation number two Paul says to the Christians to imitate us, verses 7 and 8. Imitate what the apostles did when they were among them. Imitate us. We were not idle. We worked with our hands for the bread that we ate, even though it would have been our right to have it for free, he says. Paul was there. We don't need to elaborate on this a lot, but Paul was there and He could have received the hospitality of the people there as he was ministering. It was his right to do so. But instead, he worked with his hands as a leather worker, as a tent maker, to pay his own way so that he could be an example to them during that time. That's motivation number two. Imitate the apostles. Example number three, or motivation number three, is found in verse 10. And it says, If anyone is not willing to work, Let him not eat. Now that, my friends, is a maxim of common sense. It's a New Testament proverb of sorts. And as you think about that, and as we talked a moment ago, that might sound harsh in some ways. And you might, in your mind, be thinking about trying to trying to synthesize that with what you thought the Christian community was supposed to be like. I mean, Acts chapter 4 tells us, it says in verse 32, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. So on one hand, the Christians shared everything that they had, making sure that no one would go without. But on the other hand, there was an internal policing about how people conducted themselves regarding this reality. Being out of order, being idle, wasn't allowed Working hard was a moral virtue. And the idea of work and laziness in the economy of God is woven throughout many of the scriptures, and we see it particularly in a number of places in the book of Proverbs. Here's just a couple for you. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 11 says, Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. But he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Or Proverbs 19, 15. It says, slothfulness casts into a deep sleep. And an idle person will suffer 
hunger. Nothing motivates someone to get back to work like an empty stomach. And the maxim, you shall not eat if you do not work, or if you do not eat, you, if you do not work, you shall not eat. The maxim is a warning to those who are unwilling. You know, you can tell a lazy person very often from a mile away by the things that they say, the things that they do or don't do, even how they present themselves. There was a story in the LA Times a number of years ago about a man who went to his childhood home And he knocked on the door because he hadn't lived there for 20 years. And he found himself getting sentimental. And as he was engaging with the owners of the home, he asked if he could come in and walk through the house. And the owners welcomed him in and said, sure. And as he walked through the house, he even went up to the attic. And in the attic, he found an old coat of his. And as he put the old coat on, reminiscing of days gone by, he reached into the pocket And he found a receipt from a shoe repair shop. He realized that he had taken a pair of shoes to the cobbler to be repaired during the middle of his move, and he had never picked them up. He had simply forgot about it in the hustle and bustle of moving. And so as he said goodbye to the homeowners and went on his way, he thought that he would go to the shoe repair shop and just play a little joke on the cobbler that day. And so he walked in, in confidence, and laid his receipt on the counter and said, are my shoes ready yet? The man looked at the receipt, said, hold on one moment. He went to the back room. Five minutes later, he emerged and said, come back a week from Thursday. That's the mind of the lazy person. That's the mind of the sluggard. They're always saying a week from Thursday. And Proverbs says that the sluggard will go hungry. And Paul says, if you're unwilling to work, let that person not eat. And that's a motivation for those who are idle. Motivation number four is seen in verse 11, and that is, Simply this, that when you're idle, you get into trouble. (laughs) So work diligently and quietly about your business. Look at verse 11. It gives this great play on words. It says, for we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Not busy at work. But busy bodies, now such persons we command in the Lord Jesus to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Not busy at work, but busy bodies. Isn't that the case? That when you don't have your own work to attend to, that you're always getting to other people's business. And this leads to gossip and to slander and to all kinds of bad behaviors. The person who's not doing their own thing gets into other people's business. They become a meddler. But the exhortation for you, Christian, is to be working, to have a working life, to be steady and quiet in other places of the Scripture as well. We see this very dynamic. Work diligently, work quietly, earn your own keep. I think, I think of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, a couple chapters behind this in the previous book. Paul says, you want an aspiration for life, Christian? It's not the aspiration of Instagram. It's to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. The fifth encouragement comes in verse 13. Look at it with me. It says, As for you, brothers, do not grow weary 
in doing good. Don't go grow weary in doing good. Why is it important that he finishes a series of encouragements, motivations, and rebukes, warnings, with a word about not growing weary in doing good? That's important because when there are some people who are freeloading, it becomes easy for us for the rest of us, to stop being charitable to those who truly need it. We become cynical. It's easy to lump all of those with perceived needs into one group of people. And the freeloaders wreck it for the givers, and it wrecks it for those who are truly needy. In 1997, I was a freshman in college in downtown Chicago, and I was experiencing interactions with homeless people regularly for the very first time. And like any freshman, your heart wells up and it melts as you see abject poverty. And you find yourself walking from street to street some days on the way to your destination, opening your wallet repeatedly to give your money away to people because of their perceived need. But as time goes on, you realize that some of the homeless are there because of genuine need. Some of them are there because of addiction. And even with that, some of them want to fight it and some of them don't. And some of them are homeless because of choice. They're unwilling to work. And in fact, what happens over time is that the heart, which was once soft and tender toward those who had need, starts to become cold. As one day you offer to buy a homeless person a sandwich instead of giving them money, and they snap at you. Because they don't want food, they want something else. Cynicism sets in. And before you know it, you grow weary of doing good. You have no more compassion for the people of need. Because you start to lump them all into the same category. But Paul says, don't grow weary. Christian, don't grow weary of helping people in need. Don't grow weary of doing good. Do the work of deciphering real need in the Christian community. Continue to be compassionate to those who are unable to work. Continue to share with God's people. Don't grow weary in doing good. God cares about your work. And your work reflects something about God. And here's the great news. The great news is that you know how hard your work is. You know how sweet rest feels and how motivation for you is sometimes lacking and how laziness has the propensity to set in. And we set out from the beginning that these, the reality of the difficulties of work are because of our sin nature. The first sins of Adam and Eve found in the nature of us found in the land that's been cursed because of that sin. But through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven of our sin. We're given a new life and a new perspective. And part of this new life and this new perspective is to recognize our work in the right place as it reflects the working nature of God himself and recognizes the grace of work to us. So the gospel itself informs our work. We work hard as unto the Lord. We recognize the grace that God gives. And we display or we mirror God's character as we work. God cares about your work. And your work reflects something about God. Now let me make a brief word about retirement. 
Because that's the elephant in the room, isn't it? Many of you are retired. Many of you are looking forward to the day of your retirement. Many of you have worked hard. You've saved your money. You're not a drain on the church community or other people. And so the question becomes, what does the biblical understanding of work have to do with retirement? How does the reality of this teaching fit into your life right now? I think the answer is simple. If you look at retirement as a life of leisure and recreation, I think you're looking at it wrongly. I think, according to the biblical teaching, you need to look at retirement not as just a life of leisure, but perhaps a different kind and a different season of work. Maybe it's slower in its pace, because you're slower. It's most likely outside of your career vocation. But friends, God's work isn't done yet. The work in your family isn't done yet. And work, even in retirement years, some kinds of work is still good for you, according to God's word. And so don't waste the last, please don't waste the last third of your life on recreation and leisure. Continue in some ways to work for the Lord. God cares about your work. And your work reflects something about God. The passage closes... And the book closes with a word about peace. The peaceful life. The the result of following the teachings of God is peace. It says in verse 16, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. You can have peace with God through faith in Jesus to forgive you of your sins and restore your relationship with God. That is available for you today. Some of you are internally at war with God. Some of you are overwhelmed by the guilt that is pressed upon you. Some of you are looking at the path of your life and you're saying, this life is leading me into bad places. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus is that you can have peace with God. You need but reach out to him and take it. To say, Jesus, forgive me my sins. Restore me to you. Give me a new life so that I can experience this type of peace. God wants you to do that, even right now, even today. But more than just peace with God spiritually, or more than peace as it relates to just the end of this incredible passage, Paul is indicating that there is a peace from God that comes as you follow the teachings of this whole book. You'll have peace with God as you glorify Christ with your good resolves, chapter 1. You'll have peace even as you are prepared to stand firm and persevere in the midst of the Antichrist, chapter 2. You'll have peace because you're standing firm and holding fast because your hope is in God's grace. And you can have peace from God because he cares about your work and because your work reflects something about God. A peaceful life. The life that God has for you. And it's as a result of following Christ. 
Friends, I hope that you have that peace. If you have questions about receiving the Lord in that way and following him, we'd love to talk to you about that. And I want to ask you now to pray with me as we thank God for the type of peace that he gives. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we do not have to live perpetually at war with you. Thank you, God, that we do not have to perpetually be avoiding work, even as difficult as it might be, but that you care about it, that the gospel redeems work, that you inform how we are to live as a result, and that you give us Christian community to encourage us and to correct us. God, help those who are un willing to work today to have a new and good resolve. Father, help those who are unable to work today and continue to provide for their needs and continue to provide for them in many ways through their physical families as the scripture teaches us and their spiritual family, this church family as the scripture teaches us. God, we long to be people who are fulfilled in this life. And we know and we see again and again that following you and even following you in our work is part of that fulfillment. And so we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen.